I'm Scott McGowan. And I'm Anne Marie Singleton. Now, I think even for our listeners, too, I think what's important is um, we might be right, we might be wrong, but one thing is, is we're not afraid. Right. And we have a point of view, and I think that people should hear it. And we're unscripted. We just have free reign for 20 minutes. Welcome to Side Effects with an A. Welcome back to Side Effects. I'm Scott McGowan. I'm here with my good friend, Alex Schrobmeyer from Beam. So one of the things that uh, was like I was super curious about, because we're, we're going to talk about your organization and we're going to talk about your company, which is super uh, progressive. One of the things that really kind of caught me off guard, so I was in our Columbus office and I saw this on someone's desk and I was like, that's a cool brand. Right. Why does somebody have a toothbrush on the I desk? I know. And <laughs> um, like, I want to know more about this. Because uh, I'm kind of uh, really intrigued, so I'm kind of like a squirrel. I like shiny objects, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm a big believer in brand and things that are super creative. Uh, and history has always been like, I'll just go to CVS and buy a toothbrush. Make sense? Sure. And uh, this really kind of took me back. I was like, I need to know more about this organization. And then I started reading about you. Uh, and uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up. Yeah, yeah. So uh, quick background on me. So I grew up in the northern Kentucky area, really close to uh, Cincinnati, um, and uh, always wanted to build things growing up. That was my passion, was was the process of building something. So for a while, that meant actually tearing things down. I would take any uh, electronics of a TV broke in the house. I was the guy ripping it apart and looking at all the electronics on the inside. See, my son, he wouldn't even wait for it to break. He would just tear it apart. He would just tear it apart. <laughs> And then claim it was already broken. Oh, afterwards. big time. Yeah, yeah. And then he would say this. It was an accident. Right. It yeah. fell over and uh -huh. it's not my fault. Exactly. Uh, so I had the engineering bug uh, early on in life. Um, ended up getting really uh, into building tree houses. So I built nine tree houses in Seriously? my backyard between ages like seven and 10 or 11. Wow. So that was my thing. So I was, you know, I'd, uh, my grandpa had a bunch of, uh, it, it had a farm and a bunch of wood lying around from, you know, projects. And um, I would... Uh, take the wood from him, haul it back to my house, drag it up into the woods. And so you love the show, The uh, Treehouse Master? Of course. I know. My wife and I, we watch it all the time. And at the time, I was a big home improvement fan with oh, uh, Tim the Toolman Taylor yeah. and uh, Bob Vila and all those guys. Oh, and so big we'd time. watch all those, you know, mm -hmm. this old house style shows. Uh, so if I wanted a treehouse, yeah. you, you, you would call help. me. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And then we can Airbnb it and the whole deal. <laughs> Jackpot. <laughs> So I, uh, so you know, I grew up with this real passion around um, tearing things down and, and building things. So that kind of idea of creative destruction was always um, front and center for me. Um, ended up going to uh, Louisville, moving to Louisville at 18 to uh, go to their engineering school. That got me the you know um, academic skills I needed to build things professionally, and then also a bunch of experience. So I was working in, at the time in construction. Uh, but was developing uh, actually much more of an interest in technology at the same time. So if I go back to like Alex, um, that is uh, wants to be an engineer, mm -hmm. uh, goes to the University of Louisville. We already talked about uh, your family. Um, you're from Kentucky, right? So you got some Wildcat fans. Plenty. You decide <laughs> plenty. Yeah. You decide to go to the, the University of Louisville. By yep. the way, uh, for our listeners, it's not Louisville or Louisville. You it's say as little of the word as possible. Louisville. 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 Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, Marbles in the mouth. It, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I had uh, aunts and uncles that taught me that. Yeah. That's a good thing to know. Uh, and then, so when, when you think about what you thought you were going to grow up to be, like, what did you think Alex would be sitting here today? I knew I was going to be an entrepreneur. Uh, that was clear from... Maybe by 10 years old, okay. I, my you know parents can reference this today. They said that I was always obsessed with the idea of owning a company. The bigger question was, what type of company would it mm -hmm. be? When would it happen? That type of thing. It was never a question of, of if, but when. Yeah, because I think society normally thinks of uh, engineering, and then you think of entrepreneur, and let's just face it, sometimes it's they would say, well, I'm not sure that makes a ton of sense to me. Right. Kind of opposite uh, parts of the brain in many correct. ways. Engineers are trying to mitigate risk and entrepreneurs want to take risk. Absolutely. Right? Uh, and, you know, I'll equate it to, you know, society needs visionaries uh, and then society needs engineers. Uh, and I've never met a visionary, a visioneer, somebody that can do both really, really, really well. It's rare. Well, apparently you can. 
which is fascinating. So then, you know, in your bio, it, it, there is this uh, title of uproar. Mm -hmm. So what, what's, what's uproar? Yeah, so, um, so I had met these two uh, uh, other really, really smart guys in engineering school in Louisville. Um, both ended up being from northern Kentucky, but we actually didn't know each other growing up, all met in, in college. So we were going through our engineering program, um, and we're mostly homework buddies. So we had a lot of classes mm -hmm. um, together, uh, lived near each other in the dorms, so we were just hanging out a lot. It turns out that they had some of the same entrepreneurial um, urges that um, I had, and so it ended up kind of all coalescing around um, building a services company. So Uproar Labs is essentially a um, R&D business. Um, for us as 19 year olds or 20 year olds at the time meant that we would do what literally whatever you hired us to do. So if you wanted a website, yeah, we figured out how to we'll build a website. That. Yeah. You want to build, uh, we ended up doing a lot of work in- You want a tree uh, house? Yeah, you want we'll a tree house? <laughs> if the price yeah. is right, we'll do it, right? Um, Ended up doing a lot of work in, in medical devices. So there's a lot of healthcare activity in, uh, in Louisville. And since we were part of the university's engineering oh, program, yeah. which was promoting biomedical engineering uh, quite aggressively at the time, uh, we were building pieces and parts of medical devices. Hmm. So um, mechanical CAD modeling, we were helping write patents. We were doing all kinds of random work, but it was giving us the foundations upon which um, we ended up building Beam. And so we ran essentially a services business for two or three years. And then as that started to mature, we realized there was an opportunity to do something much more product focused and experience focused. And that's what led us to, to Beam. Wow. So the, the folks, uh, your, uh, your roommates, mm -hmm. uh, and then you talk about uproar, any of those same folks inside it's of Beam? It's all the same guys. Is it really? Yeah. Seriously? My two co-founders in uproar labs really? are my two co-founders at, at Beam. We've been together for eight, nine years now. Now, is Uproar still around? No. We uh, kind of sunset the company just as we uh, you know, wanted to do less yeah. kind of work for others and mm -hmm. more work for us. And so once we started Beam, we uh, raised some money early on, and then that became kind of the impetus to go full-time after what, what you see in front of you today. So three engineers yeah. that can potentially build tree houses. At least uh, one of us. Gotcha. Uh, and then so you start this kind of incubator called Uproar. Right. Who, what are we going to be? And then out of that births beam. You got it. Why, why, why dental? Yeah, so um, common question. Um, we got to dental roundabout, right? So we were doing um, uproar. We were building, uh, you know, across a dozen different industries, all of which look interesting, right? Because, again, our goal is to build things. Yeah. It didn't really matter necessarily what industry, what the specific products were. Um, one of the co-founders, his mom has been a dental hygienist for 20, 25 years. Hmm. My sister at the time was in dental school, is now a dentist, and uh, her husband, my brother-in-law, also a dentist. Um, and so we had some forces in our lives at the oh, time gotcha. yeah. that gave us a reason to mm -hmm. look specifically at the dental industry. I'd say we had developed a pretty specific interest in healthcare. And then dental is this very interesting kind of forgotten mm -hmm. piece of healthcare that had almost no innovation mm -hmm. in it. And so one of our big early observations was that even though there were 100 million Americans that didn't have dental insurance and therefore affordable access to dental services, there were um, almost no one. Uh, there were no companies, there were no entrepreneurs trying to solve that problem. The rest of healthcare had people trying to invent drugs and devices and yeah. um, health IT, a ton of activity, right? Um, and ton of disruption happening in healthcare, and that's still true today. Um, the dental industry just sees a very, very small percentage. Yeah, of I that think from activity. you know, from a, you know, consumers lens, uh, especially in our world. So we walk, we work with a lot of employers, and we talk uh, mostly about healthcare, and then obviously the advent of prescription drugs. We we focus a lot of time, and then it gets to dental, and it gets to life insurance, and it gets to vision, and things just get quieter. Right. It's a tiny piece of that conversation. However, I, I you know, I don't, I don't think what a lot of people really understand is the fact that. Um, uh, dental is a gigantic indicator of health. Right. Uh, and fortunately, uh, even some larger insurance companies are starting to look at that through data analytics, disease mitigation, uh, that there is a gigantic lens to look through in regards to what is the future risk score of a population and how do we mitigate and um, look at uh, a disease state inside of a workforce. Yeah. For us, this is really the founding thesis of the business is that there's this huge uninsured population. Folks that, are, that do have insurance coverage today are missing something, mm -hmm. which is that connectivity to the rest of the body. And yet, we all understand 
what preventative health means mm -hmm. in dental. It's a much uh, more complex and um, murkier equation in healthcare. There's so many variables that go into what it means to have great health and mitigating mm -hmm. risk in, inside the, the health market. Dental's pretty simple. Brush your teeth, floss your teeth, and see a dentist regularly, Yeah. right? And so our whole company is built on the premise that we're encouraging more preventative care by including the products you need to have yeah. good dental care as part of the insurance, and then encourage people to see the dentist regularly. And what we hope there is less of over time are the nasty stuff. We want less root canals, mm -hmm. we want less crowns and bridges, we want less um, teeth that fail, right? So fewer fillings, uh, fewer invasive problems in the mouth. If, the re if, if our patient population one day soon is just going to the dentist to get checkups and two thumbs up from their dentist, yeah. then, then we know we've figured so it out. So when does, when, when does Beam sit back and say, we put a dent in this marketplace? Like what, 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 what's your big dream? Yeah, so the, the big goal of the business ultimately and the vision of the business is to solve this uninsured mm -hmm. population. Because right. it's a huge group of people. Oh, I mean, a hundred million people mm -hmm. are not participating uh, in the insurance marketplace yet today. And there are reasons for that. Mm -hmm. um, part of it is that the distribution of dental insurance is mostly through employers. So if you Fair. happen not to have an employer or one that is offering a dental plan, you don't have cost-effective access mm -hmm. into that market. Um, the other problem is that the, um, the public does not prioritize dental health in the same way that it does. Correct. The yeah. rest of healthcare. There are reasons for that. Mm -hmm. The consequences are totally different, right? Well, I didn't think in Ohio. So one of the things that uh, that we're super curious about it, the health of our country is terrible, in comparison to the world. Right. The health of Ohio is 40th among all 50 states. Really? Yeah. And then you look at us by county, and uh, you guys are in Columbus, right? right. Franklin County. Right. Uh, not very high. Uh, and then Montgomery County is even worse. Yeah. Um, so we're almost the worst of the worst. Uh, and then when you think about socially, how do we adapt to that population? Right. Because I think what's important for people to understand is um, if you pay taxes, you pay for health care. In be a somebody, significant way. And an increasingly time. significant yeah, way. Yeah, whether those right. folks are on Medicaid, whether they're on Medicare, or whether they're on an employer chassis, we're all paying for this $3.4 trillion engine moving forward. So when when, when I look at your product... Uh, it's obviously, um, it's just cool, and uh, I'm not sure you can make like that cool. But you like you did it. You we, guys have an we, app. We like to say we've figured out how to make dental not uncool. At that's least. Yeah, that's making it actually cool is that's tricky. Yeah, but I I don't disagree. So when you talk about an underserved population, um, what are you doing to uh, to go after that population? Yeah. So um, today we mostly like other. Uh, carriers in the dental space are distributing through um, uh, phenomenal brokers like McGowan to great businesses. You said phenomenal. I phenomenal. love that word. Phenomenal. phenomenal. I like that. We're going through mostly you know small, medium-sized employers mm -hmm. today, starting to make a dent in the market in terms of encouraging more, especially small businesses, to offer a dental plan, even if it's a voluntary plan, mm -hmm. even if it's bare bones and basic offer something to your employees, so even if you've got three, four people, come up with some sort of basic benefits program that we would love to participate in because we have found that we can cost effectively insure folks in the smallest groups possible because of our underwriting methodologies and because of our preventative care tools in a way that you can't get the comparable quality out of the major carrier plans. Yeah, and you guys have, uh, you've got a cool app. Right, and so we you know, can address smaller, newer, mm -hmm. and younger skewing um, employee populations in a way that others can as well. And so that's starting to address some of the distribution mm -hmm. issues that we see uh, in the dental space. And over time, look, we gotta, like anybody else, we have to figure out how to, you know, similar to your point on Ohio's overall health mm -hmm. profile, the Midwest's overall health profile, the middle of the country's overall health profile, and really the whole country's overall health profile. We have to figure out how to make big population dense uh, from a management perspective uh, as it relates to oral care. Yeah, and I think even from an employer perspective, so you look at the cost of benefits, which are running about $12,000 per employee per year. It's expensive. Uh, and a lot of times, I mean, let's face it, it's hard to make, it's hard to make this sexy, right. that $12,000 transaction. Um, but you have made it attractive. And sexy and effective it, is the goal. Yeah, and you've made it different, um, which is uh, a heck of a lot better 
than the products that we have on a shelf today. Uh, now, whether people are going to adapt to it, whether they're going to move into it, whether they're going to be committed or uh, compliant is a completely different uh, question. However, um, you've made a significant dent in that. And so we just applaud you for, yeah, for we, that. We, are, um, we appreciate it. What we know is that we have something and we don't have something. What we have today is a brand that has brought kind of the physical component to insurance. Mm -hmm which is a huge advantage because my brand sits on your sink every day. You use our products every Otherwise, day. Otherwise, I've just got, if I have an ID card. Right. If I have it. If. If. Uh, it's hidden in your wallet until correct. you need it and you don't, you know, and yeah. it's just a piece of plastic. Great idea. Day. So the physical representation and the brand loyalty that comes with associating our insurance quality with our product quality um, is important to us. Um, and something we're continuing to invest in and will continue to invest in over time because it's never good enough, right? Mm -hmm. You always have to incrementally improve um, what we're putting in people's hands. What we don't have yet is the awareness and recognition of how this association with the preventative care goods, toothpaste, floss, mm -hmm. toothbrushes, um, can and is having an impact on uh, disease rates and then ultimately dental health outcomes. Um, that story is a story that has to be told by our broker partners. Correct. And that, and the better and better we can do in partnership uh, with folks like you to tell that story, not only does that help our company grow, which is great, but it's helping teach the market that dental should be prioritized alongside other health initiatives. Yeah, and we're company. starting to get a lot more information in regards to what's below the iceberg. Right. So we're looking at unit cost, you know, X cost Y, and this is how, this is what the transaction is. In other words, you know, what are some of the elements beneath that that can make a significant difference in the spend of health care for employers? Right. And so kind of as we kind of wrap up, a um, couple things. Number one, um, just, you know, thanks for your energy and uh, thanks for taking a risk. We're, we're happy to be here doing it. And, and the big bet, because uh, a good friend of mine has always said, thanks for putting your capital at risk to do one of the greatest things on this planet, and that's create jobs uh, in a community. And to do it in a way that, um, let's face it, is, uh, it's, it's fresh, it's new, it's exciting, and it's making a significant difference. So for our listeners, we'll put some information out on healthierbirthdays.com in regards to being how you get more information. But as this generation, so in our studio, we're looking at some younger people, because um, I'm not as young as I used to be, uh, and let's face it, uh, generationally, uh, just like we look at McGowan Braven in a different way, we have to attract a different uh, workforce. Right. So thanks for being on Side Effects. Thank you. Thanks for having us here. Thanks for doing everything that you do and have an amazing day. Thanks for listening and opening your mind. If you're interested in learning more, you can reach us at scott at healthierbirthdays.com. Or Ann at healthierbirthdays.com. We hope you'll join us next time on, on Side, Side Effects. Effects.